God. God, I thank you for, for redeeming us of our sin, God. And, and Jesus, thank you for restoring us back to the Father. Holy Spirit, I pray that you soften our hearts and prepare us for your message tonight. I pray that you speak through Chad. And let it be 100% your words coming out tonight. Lord, we thank you once again, God, and we proclaim that you are holy and worthy of our praise, God. And we love you, Lord, and in your holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. You could be seated tonight. I also want to say welcome to those that are viewing online via our Ustream um, tonight. We're glad to have you all here, or if you found us on YouTube, thanks for joining us. Uh, if you're following along, if you're one of the millions who have the uh, Uversion uh, Bible app on your phone, the notes are for you there tonight if you just click the live button. However, um, I'm not going to use those, okay? Um, just from time to time, there's times that I come and I think I'm prepared for where I think the Lord wants to take us. And then just sometimes during worship, as I just listen to the Lord, he says, hey, throw that stuff away. That's not what I want you to do tonight. And so tonight is one of those nights. And so uh, bear with me. The message that I want to share tonight is absolutely um, not in your version. Um, it's just something that God's uh, reminded me of. But before we do that, let me just tell you a couple of things. We've been in the middle of a series called The Generosity of God, and um, that title applies. It's sufficient. It'll work for tonight's message as well. But during the last few weeks, we've discovered several things. We've discovered that there are benefits to being generous, um, things like people begin to see what matters most in our life by seeing where we're the most generous. Um, we please God. Um, other people become grateful for our generosity. We've talked about sowing and reaping. We've talked about um, giving our first fruits and, and giving to God first. And, and um, we've been in the middle of the 12 days of Christmas. We've, we've been excited to give. We've done everything from delivering gifts to nursing homes to doing the drive through difference to the, the DPS and all those things. And tomorrow we're getting ready to embark on a journey with First Methodist and some other churches here in our community um, that is going to make a significant difference. And if you don't mind, I want to take us on a journey tonight just to remind us why is it that we've done all the things we've done? Why is it we're going to embark on the journey to do what we're going to do tomorrow? Uh, why is that? What, why are we going to, to join with Radical Christmas and service like 400 with groceries? Is that right? 850 children with gifts? Um, tomorrow, we are partnering with that. So what's the significance? Why is it that we do this? Why is it important that we capture the heart of God that says you and I are called to, to overwhelming generosity in our life? Well, to begin, I have to start in Romans chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, grab that. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. The awesome thing is this. This message that I'm going to share with you tonight, it's, it's what connects and join us in our generosity. It's the very single solitary thing that captures and connects our hearts with First United Methodists, with other churches in our city. It's that one single thread, and it simply is the greatest story known to man. It is the gospel of Jesus. It is the reality, listen to me this evening, that Jesus came born of a virgin, born in a manger, born as a child, but certainly the end was a cross. It was death, burial, and a resurrection that would restore us and redeem us. 
The reality is we are gathered here tonight, and every one of us, I don't care where you are from, I don't care your lot, I don't care if you attend weekly at FUMC or Terra Nova or somewhere else, the reality is we've all come to the table with a need. We've all come to the table with a need. In Romans chapter 6, or excuse me, 3, verse 23, it says this, For all have sinned. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Again, that word all, I love doing this with our folks here at Terra Nova. Somebody help me define the word all. Everybody, that's everybody. That's your mama, that's your daddy, that's your sister, that's your brother, that's your mama, that's your in-laws, that's your co-workers, that's your boss, that's everybody. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, that term sin is actually an archery term. It's an archery term. If I were to, to take my bow and my arrow, and I have a bullseye downrange, and I pull my bow back, and when I let go, something distracts me, and I see that I'm going to miss the target altogether, I would yell something like this, sin! It's kind of like golf, if you've ever played with me. Um, we just use a different term, don't we? It's fun! Stop laughing over there, okay? They played golf with me. So, so sin is an archery term, and here's what it means. It means I've missed the mark. And so you and I, we come to the table with this overwhelming reality that we have missed the mark. What is the mark? It's God's standard of holiness. You and I have missed the mark. And here's the other reality tonight. And it should be the reality that motivates us. It ought to be the, the reality that, that we hit our, our floor with our feet running tomorrow. This reality that not only have we missed the mark, but we have a city filled with men and women who have missed the mark. They, they have failed to keep the standard of God. And so all of us, take your finger, that, that means me, say it, that means me. We've all missed the mark. Now, I wish I could tell you that because you've missed the mark that that was a good thing. It's not a good thing. If you'll flip with me to Romans 6, verse 23. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says this. It says, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death is death. Somebody tell me what a wage is. Something you earn. Hey man with the hat right here, can you come up here and help me a second? You'll thank me in a minute. Tell me your name. What is it? Hunter? Hey, give Hunter a hand real quick. Um, so now Hunter, do you understand what a wage is? Like if you do a job, you earn a wage, right? Okay, so you feel like earning a wage tonight? Sure, okay. Well, here's the deal. I have a car that is messy, okay? And so it needs to be cleaned, like, like washed and vacuumed out, okay? The going rate for something like that in this town is about 10 bucks. So to get a car washed, 10 bucks. So tonight, are you willing to earn 10 bucks? Okay, so Jennifer, will you get out a checkbook? Hunter, what is your last name? Wesling. Make the check out to Hunter Wesling for 10 bucks. Put on the memo, car wash. Okay? Uh, so now here's the deal. In order for you to get this 10 bucks, what do you got to do now? Got to wash the car. That's what you do to deserve it. Is, are we all on the same page? Okay? Scripture says, for the wages of sin is death. And so the wages of sin is death. So if you sin, what you earn is death. Let me ask a question tonight. Let's make sure we're on the same page. Anybody in here, were you included in all? Have you sinned? Have you missed the mark? So we've all earned a wage, right? And so what we deserve for our actions is death, the separation from God for all eternity. That's what we deserve. 
Let me ask you like this. Jonah, did anybody ever teach you to sin? No. Ethan, did your mom and dad set you down and teach you to do things that displease them? No, but we do them anyway. It says that we're born sinners. We're born into sin. Nobody teaches to do that. We're predisposed to sinfulness. And so now, check this out. I want to finish reading the verse before I give Hunter his check, okay? Check this out. It says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift, the free gift of God, the generosity of God is Jesus our Lord. So now, Hunter, what's the difference between a wage and a gift? I'll help you out. I know that it's just, you know, stardom and all. The difference between a wage is you got to wash my car, right? And then you earn that, right? You wash my car, you earn that. Now, a gift, what do you do to earn a gift? Nothing, right? You don't earn a gift. So check this out. You and I, church family, we got to get this. This is why we do 12 days of Christmas. This is why we are absolute adamant on living a life of generosity. That's why we will get up tomorrow and declare the gospel at three services at Minor Convention Center because we have all been recipients of a gift. Now, I told Hunter to receive this. He had to wash my car. You still good with that? Okay. He understands. You wash my car, you get the gift. I'm going to go ahead and sign the check. But Hunter, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to erase, I'm going to walk, kind of cross through car wash. I'm going to write a different word on that memo line. What's the word I wrote? Gift. Gift. Check this out, Hunter. I don't know if you understand the magnitude of this. Church, I don't understand. I don't know if we understand the magnitude of this. But our Savior, who is rich in love, rich in mercy, overwhelming with generosity, He saw our need. He saw us in over our head. He saw that you and I, we deserve, we earned for ourselves a home in eternity in hell. We deserved it because of His generosity. He said it's canceled, paid in full. It's no longer anything you earn, but Hunter, it is a gift. Have fun, buddy. You got ten bucks. You do not have to wash my car. You don't have to wash my car. It's a gift. You see, we give gifts because we are recipients of the greatest gift in all humanity. My favorite scripture is this. Romans chapter 5, verse number 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says this. It says, While we were sinners, while we were sinners, Scripture says, Christ died for us. You see, I love the reality that God was not conditional with his generosity. He didn't wait till I had it figured out. He didn't wait till I started dressing like everybody else. He didn't wait till I had it figured out. He didn't wait till I memorized John 3.16. He didn't wait until I signed up for membership class. He didn't wait. He, while I was a sinner, he sent Jesus to be born of a virgin to be my redemption. While I was a sinner, Christ died for me. Now some of you, you have to go ahead and begin to make that a little personal. Go ahead and get your index finger back out. He died for me. Say that tonight. Make that your own. You got to understand that. When we understand, when we receive the magnitude, when we understand the graciousness, the love, the mercy, the generosity of God in our lives, we cannot help. Hear me. We cannot help but to desire to live out a life of generosity to see to it that those in this city will see and experience the same love and mercy that you and I walk in. You see, tomorrow's not about groceries. It's not about toys and gifts. It's about the greatest gift known to humanity, and it is the birth of Jesus who came to redeem us. 
You see, if you remember this first message in this series, the generosity of God, we were in Exodus chapter 13. And God said to Moses, I need you to do something, Moses. I need you to offer the firstborn of all your flocks. Now, if you, if you are giving, if you have a donkey, an unclean that gives birth, you need to redeem it. And the reality is, you and I, on that first week, we identified that we were born unclean. We, we most identify with the donkey. And, and I'm not going to make the same connection I did that first week, but what is the term that we also use for donkey? Yeah, it doesn't take long in my life to make one of those of myself. But he says, for every donkey, you redeem it with a lamb. You see, the lamb of God was sent to redeem you and I. While we were still sinners, he didn't wait for you to get it all together. And tomorrow we'll be offering groceries. We'll be offering toys. But we also are going to offer the hope of the gospel of Jesus that makes all things new, that redeem you and I. I don't know if you understand the magnitude of why it is that we give and why we're generous you see, it, it's not that we work, we don't work toward, we don't work for our acceptance. You see, the reality is, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He sealed the deal. He did it. He paid the debt. He came. He was born as a sinless, spotless Lamb of God. He lived a perfect life. He went to Calvary. He there died. They put him in a tomb, and the tomb and everything grew silent for one day, for two days, and for three days. But on the third day, he rose again to the glory of God to bring about your restitution, your restoration, your hope, and your fulfillment and the reality is we don't work for that we work from that because if you get it if you understand it you want to get up and you want to serve and, and I'm telling you you cannot outgive God you see I just think it would do us well to to even as we go into Christmas this week to make sure that our heart and our perspective is right for those of you that attend Terranova Church, you've heard me say this over the last few weeks. It's not about your money. It's not about your possessions. It's not about your stuff. It's about your heart. It's about your heart. See, we had a conversation this week with my little John Luke even. What is, what is Christmas about? Why do, we, why do we give gifts? John Luke can tell you. What did God give us, John Luke? Jesus. Hey, we're going to have some fun at my house. We're going to bust open wrapping paper. We're going to do those things. But I pray that as we enter into this season this week, that our heart's ready to give the most precious gift. It should burden us. It should sadden us that we live in a city of over 18,000. And on any given weekend, only about 25% are in church. You see, the fun thing is, we are united, we are partners in the generosity of God because we've come to the same table and we've received. And I promise you, there's enough lostness in this city. Church, hear me. Friends, hear me. There's enough lostness in this city for all of us. And so as we embark tomorrow to join hands, to lock arms, I pray that we would absolutely consider the greatest gift, the gospel that has changed our lives. Now, I could ask some of you as individuals, what is the greatest story man to, known to mankind? And you would tell me it's the story of Christmas. It's Jesus who came to redeem you and rescue you. And you would tell me how it's changed your life, turned it upside down, how you're living for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and you can't wait for him to return. But the honest truth is then I'm going to ask some of you, well, what have you done to celebrate that? What have you done to propel that? I mean, if it's been so earth-shattering, it's been so life-changing, what have you done to make a difference so others could receive that which you've had, that which you have? And some of you would have to go, 
you know, as you say that, I've not really given anything. If it's absolutely life-changing, if it's restored you and redeemed you, you will contribute so that the lost world might receive that which you have. Again, it's not about your stuff. It's not about your money. It's about a changed life and a heart that has been set ablaze by the story of the gospel. You see, we like to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Yay, Jesus! But it's a little harder for us to swallow the reality that he came as that perfect lamb to redeem. You see, we have been asked as the body of Christ to join the creator of the universe. He doesn't need us. Hear me. He doesn't need us. But he chooses to use us. Church, there is no plan B. There is no plan B. You are plan A. The gospel, it is in your hands. The salvation of our city is at stake, and you hold it tonight. So the question is this tonight. I'm going to ask Jake to come, and we're going to have a time of invitation. And I would love nothing more than... For us just to respond to the message, to respond to the gospel. For some of you here tonight, you can say honestly within your life, you've never received the gift of salvation. You've never received that. We, we want to offer that tonight. But for some of you here tonight, you've received and, and you are absolutely gung-ho and ready to declare the story of Christmas and the gospel this week. And so I would just say that the altar is open. I would love to see us link arms and to pray and to, to ready ourselves. Turn over church, I, I can tell you this. Um, done enough life with Brad and some of these folks. Their heartbeat is ours. They love Jesus. They love Jesus. The Jesus born in the manger that came to die. We gather around that manger, around that throne tonight. In fact, I've got to tell you some good news, church family. I sent an email out this week about the need and about year-end giving and, and all that. Yesterday, check this out. Charles and I broke our backs along with Brad and a couple other guys. But the need, there's some vital components, by the way, just so you know. If you're going to open a bakery, there's a few things like, that are absolute must. And yesterday, because of the generosity of fellow members and believers in the kingdom of God, because of your generosity, there was an oven and a stove delivered to the need yesterday. Um, and so... Church family, thank you for being sacrificial. Brad and the folks at First Methodist, thank you for your generosity. The Christmas Coalition for Radical Christmas. And by the way, if you want to follow along, there's some great notes in version. The message is great. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, talking about the generosity of the Macedonians. And it's all good stuff. You can, you can check it out there. Um, you can still do your giving online, submit your prayer request, all those things. But I felt like I would have been, been totally amiss if I didn't just remind us of who we are. Remind us as we enter into this Christmas season what it's really about. It's about that divine exchange that we put on display with our friend Hunter. It's the fact that we had earned for ourselves a wage of eternal separation. But because God is generous, because he's generous, he says paid in full, I want to extend a gift to you. So now the question for us tonight as we stand, go ahead and stand to your feet. The question tonight is this, how will you respond? How will you respond to the generosity of God? Father, we come before you tonight. And Lord, we thank you for the overwhelming generosity that you had for us. Lord, before we 
ever took our first breath, before we um, found ourselves in absolute desperation, in over our head in sin. While we were still sinners, your generosity for us came through in the birth of your son Jesus. Your son Jesus was faithful all the way to the cross, enduring our guilt, our shame, and our pain to redeem us, to restore us, to rescue us, and even to reconcile us together as the body of Christ. So God, I thank you for what it is you're doing in us and through us, specifically here in this local body. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in this season of our life. God, I pray that we would continue to be heralds and proclaimers of the good news. God, I pray that we would not just worship on the weekends out of our love for you, but God, I pray that because of your mercy, your grace, your generosity, that God, we might inundate our workplaces, that we might inundate our social lives, that we might inundate our recreational lives with living in response to the gospel. God, may we live for your good and for your glory. Church, I'm going to invite you to respond tonight. Maybe just spending some time at the altar, gaining right perspective for this week. Are you ready to respond? One, two, three. You come tonight.